Welcome to the Spot on Insurance podcast brought to you by Insurance Licensing Services of America, ILSA. This is Ted Tavares. And this is Arlene Tavares coming to you from gorgeous Puerto Rico. Today, we'll be inviting our ILSA experts to share their knowledge. But before we get started, don't forget to click on the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. And now here's our host, Doug Foresta. Hello and welcome to another episode of Spot on Insurance. This is your host, Doug Foresta. I want to remind you, if you're enjoying the episodes, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Just search for Spot on Insurance and uh, you will be able to get all of our episodes that way. My guest today is Stephanie Cantu. She's a supervisor in ILSA's licensing and compliance department. And we are going to be discussing licensing types uh, let me say a little bit about Stephanie. I'll bring her right on. Stephanie, uh, as I said, she is a supervisor in ILSA's licensing compliance department. In July in 2008, she joined the intake team. Shortly after that, her impressive skills led her to relocation with, to the renewals team. She excelled in that role and then was soon asked to join the licensing team. And following the merge of the intake licensing renewals team, she was a natural to step into the position of team leader and now supervisor. And she is the go-to person at ILSA for complex compliance questions. Uh, I could not be more pleased to have Stephanie Cantu with me. Stephanie, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, I know today we're going to be talking about some of the, the basic licensing types explained. Why don't we start with the producer license, which um, maybe that's the one that our listeners are most familiar with. Can you explain what a producer license is? I sure can. Um, and just like you said, it is the type of license that most um, listeners are going to be familiar with. It's the most common license out there. It is uh, an authorization by the state to sell, solicit, negotiate um, any kind of insurance license to receive commissions um, from the insurance products in their state. Um, and it's it's the like I said, the main type of license and underneath that is the different lines of authority that you can um, have while holding a producer license. And who would, who would need a producer license? I mean, what, what types of individuals would need to get a producer license? Anyone that is um, out there soliciting, um, putting their name out there, trying to sell any type of insurance, they would all need to have a license. Um, and that's one of the things that some of our clients get confused about is whether they actually need one or not if they don't currently have a policy in place or a policy that they're thinking of writing. Um, but states see it as if you are just trying to solicit or put your name on a policy, um, even if you don't have anything set in stone yet, it's still uh, a requirement to have that license. So, for example, I may have people who who say to you, well, I don't I don't really think I, I need a license yet because I'm just trying to drum up some business in this area. And then what you're saying is, no, you, you really do need to have that license beforehand. Is that yes. right? Yes, absolutely. Because, uh, like I said, if the states were to find out that you are um, even just drumming up, you know, trying to figure stuff out or or just trying to put your name out there without a proper license in place, then you can definitely get fined. Um, Fine for that. And where do I need to be licensed as a producer? Uh, how do I decide what states I need to be licensed in? Sure. Um, first and foremost, you would have to be licensed um, in the state that you reside in. So, you know, I live in Texas. I would have that be my first stop would be to get a Texas license um, as a resident. And from there, you would decide what states you're going to be um, soliciting business in. And that's where you would have to get non-resident licenses in those states as well. And, you know, one of the things I know that, and we're going to talk more about this, obviously, we're, we're as we go into different licenses, but do you run across, uh, do you run across clients who say, well, you know, it's kind of expensive to, to get licensed? I mean, what would you say to people who say, you know, well, it's a lot of time and money to go get licensed? Uh, that's a good question because we do actually get that a lot. And, um, you know, we we try to tell them, think about the possibilities of, you know, how much commission you're going to get and factor that in and decide for yourself, you know, is it worth paying that one-time fee to get that license, um, you know, based off of all the commission you're going to get off of it? Um 
some clients end up stepping back and thinking, okay, you know, in this state, I do have potential to get a lot of commissions, so I definitely am interested in getting a license there. And then they'll think of other states like, you know, you're you're right, that might not be the best suit for us, so I'll just kind of, you know, leave that state alone and, and bow out from that one. But um, we try to tell them just to kind of consider all their options and the possibilities of things coming up. Um, I know it's kind of hard to tell exactly you know, what the future holds and what kind of potential is out there. But I I try to always let them know, you know, if there's any little chance that you might want to do business in that state, it's best to kind of just weigh out your options and and make sure that you're covered and compliant across the board. Thank you. So, yeah, let's switch gears and talk about adjuster license. Uh, Can you say a little bit about what an adjuster license is and, and how it differs from a producer license? So with the jester licenses, um, it is different than producer because of the type of claims that they are um, going to be writing with their adjuster license. It is uh, basically going to allow them to have the authority authority to write business um, on the different claims of loss uh, or damage um, that's payable under the insurance contract. And who would need an adjuster license? So the one the individuals or um, adjusters that are interested in going off and doing those types of claims, they'll have to have that adjuster license um, in any place that it's it's um, offered to them. Unlike producer licenses, adjuster licenses, um, their requirements vary and the different types of adjuster license that is offered in that state varies as well. Um, so that's why a lot of adjusters will come to us and tell us like, hey, we are adjusters, we are wanting to do business in these certain states, Um, you know, is that possible? If that's not, what do we need to get in lieu of that? Um, But so in a sense, it's the same as producers, you know, any state that they're wanting to do business in, they'll have to be properly licensed in. It's just not as straightforward with um, exactly what is needed. And that's where we step in and, and kind of guide them in the right direction. Okay. And so what are those different, yeah, what are the, what are the different potential types sure. that I could, yeah, uh, of adjuster licenses? Sure. So the three different types of adjuster licenses that, um, you know, we mainly deal with or we mainly see clients um, end up getting is public, independent, and claims. So um, a public adjuster is the advocate for the policy holder or the insured, um, and they do the appraising and, nego- and negotiating of a claim. So an independent adjuster is um, an independent contractor hired by an insurance company. And then the last type is the claims adjuster, which um, they're the ones who investigate the insurance claims to determine exactly uh, what the extent of the insurance company's liability is. Um, So those are the three different types of adjuster licenses. And that's kind of where we, again, help them differentiate exactly what they're needing and, again, what state offers what type of adjuster license. Yeah, I could see how it would be very helpful to have to have you and your expertise because <laughs> it, it sounds like, yeah, it's not just, there's not just one license. So, uh, and, right. and like you said, it, it varies state to state. So what I might need in, in Texas might be different than what I need in New Jersey. Is that, am I understanding that exactly. correctly? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, again, that's why, um, you know, a lot of people will come to us and ask us, you know, hey, this is the type of business we're doing. You know, what is available for us in these certain states? And that's where our team jumps in and, and you know, does the research and presents to them exactly what it is that they're needing. And we, we just go from there. Have you had situations where someone said, well, I have an adjuster license in this state, but they actually had the wrong license? I mean, is there, does that happen? Yes, yes. We've had um, an individual who came in and said, you know, I'm properly licensed in uh, these states. I just want to add a couple more. And when we ran a report on them, because that's just part of our process is just to see where they're at and and make sure we have everything in our system, um, we ended up finding out and letting him know, like, yes, you do have a license, but it's unfortunately the wrong type based off of what you're telling me um, how you do your business. So we've definitely had a couple people come in with a public adjuster license when in reality with the type of job they were doing, they actually needed, you know, an independent adjuster license. So we've definitely seen that, um, brought it to their attention and helped them rectify that situation. And is that something where if you have the wrong type of license, is that basically the same situation as having no license at all? I mean, could there be fines or potential repercussions for that? Oh, for sure. Um, And that's, that's, 
a big deal of making sure that our clients are, you know, getting the right type of license and the right lines of authority to cover everything that they're doing because um, having the wrong license, like you said, is like having no license at all. So, um, and that's one thing that the clients don't necessarily realize all the time. They think, oh, I have a license, I must be covered. Um, but it all depends on the type of business that you're writing to know, you know, if you have the right one or not. Thank you. Yeah, that's really important. And again, a reason yep. I could see people <laughs> really wanting your expertise. <laughs> Spot on Insurance is sponsored by ILSA, Insurance Licensing Services of America, America's premier licensing and regulatory compliance experts. To learn more about ILSA and the services they provide, visit ilsainc.com. Let's uh, transition to surplus lines. And uh, can you talk about surplus lines, licenses, and again, who would need that? Sure. So surplus lines, um, it's an authorization by the, the departments of insurance for an individual or an entity uh, to place insurance. It's usually tied together with property and casualty um, in the non-admitted carriers market from their state. So the way I like to kind of explain it is um, like a high risk policy. So for the big, um, you know, football stadiums, that, that, that kind of thing, like something high dollar, high value, that's where you would need a surplus lines license to cover, you know, things like that. So as far as who needs one, um, again, it goes hand in hand with every different license type. If you are soliciting or, um, you know, writing any kind of policies um, that would fall under that category, then you would definitely need a surplus lines license, and that's for individuals and agencies. And the only difference in surplus lines and, say, producer license is um, surplus lines isn't um, offered to all agencies across the state. A lot of their uh, business has to be written through the individual the individual's license, the individual in charge. So um, where some states don't even offer surplus lines for agencies, they're still in compliant as long as their, you know, designated producer, their agent in charge is properly licensed for surplus lines. So just to clarify, so what you're saying is uh, in some states, if I work for an agency and there's there's a designated person who has that surplus lines license, then I could write under that person. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? No, sir, not not okay. you. You as an individual would have to have your own surplus lines license. The uh, designated producer or the agent in charge is just going to cover the agency. Cover the agency. Got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks. I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. Um, yes, sir. You know, as we get ready to wrap up this episode, I'm just curious, you know, what do you see as kind of the biggest mistakes that people make when it comes to getting their license, um, maybe even keeping their license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a lot of our clients will um, come to us thinking under the assumption that they're in good standing. They're thinking, you know, either their last vendor kept up with all their licenses properly or they themselves were able to stay on top of all their requirements properly. And um, once they come to our services and choose to allow us to do a compliance review for them, that's when we are able to, um, you know, let them know they missed a renewal last month or they actually have the wrong license type or they have, you know, one line of authority covered but not all. Um, and I think that seems to be the most common types of um, issues or, or, you know, uncompliance <laughs> type of things that the um, – clients are, are letting us discover for them and helping them get back on the right track is just the fact that they're, again, coming to us assuming that, you know, they're giving us a, a good set of licenses, everything's in good standing, and then finding out that it's actually not. Um, I think that seems to be, again, the most common thing that we find is, is the wrong license types or the fact that they're actually not active like they thought that they were. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and how important is that, right? Like you said, because you know, you, you want to, you want to be compliant, you want to stay in compliance, but we're so busy and I'm sure people just don't even, you don't even know what you don't know, right? You just don't realize. Right. Yeah. So I want to make sure again, my, my guest today has been Stephanie Cantu. She's supervisor in the ILSA's licensing 
Uh, my guest today has been Stephanie Cantu. She's a supervisor at ILSA's licensing and compliance department. And uh, as always, I encourage you to go to ilsainc.com to learn more information. But if, Stephanie, people want to reach out directly to you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Sure. They can give me a call. My direct number is 254-729-6139. And if they'd like to email me, they can do that as well. My email is scantu at ilsainc.com. Stephanie Cantu, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. By the way, our show notes and bonus resources can be found on spotoninsurance.com. Subscribe now so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks for joining us. 